you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 1 through verse 14. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend, evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through, and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see, and send unto Kedar, and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. About 600 years before Christ, the nation of Judah was facing difficult times. The northern kingdom of Israel had already fallen to Assyrian captivity. Manasseh and his son Ammon had brought wickedness into Judah. And Josiah was the young king who was trying to bring about restoration it was in his 13th year of reign that Jeremiah shows up on the scene. In, Je- in chapter 2, we, hear, we see Jeremiah speaking to Judah. First, in the first few verses, recalling the past faithfulness of Israel and Judah. The good that they had done. The fact that they had been espoused to God. The fact that they had been holy to the Lord. The fact that they had brought forth fruit for the Lord. But then he turns in verse 4 and speaks to the house of Jacob, a reference to Judah now, and recalls that Judah now has left God. That they had one time been faithful, but had now fallen to apostasy and had led themselves into idolatry. In verse 12 and verse 13, God says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. It's as if He has called His creation that obeys Him, nature, to stand as a jury or witness against the creation that was not obeying Him, His people. And His people had committed two evils as presented in verse 13. One, they had forsaken God who refers to Himself as the fountain of living waters. And two, they had hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. God is here referenced as being the fountain of living waters. A living water denotes a spring or a fountain that runs from a fresh origin. It is always fresh. It is always running. It is never stale or stagnant. It is 
therefore full of life. A cistern is a tank that is prepared or built to hold water. It is a tank that is hewn out or cut out of stone that was made for uh, holding water to use at another time. At best, these hewn out stones could only provide fresh water for a small period of time before that water was contaminated. It would become stagnant. It would become stale. It was not running. It would become not fresh and it would have to be replaced. The cistern itself would become cracked and broken. It would not retain water forever. So God says to His people, you had the living water which comes from above, which never runs dry, which never gets stale, which never gets stagnant, which always produces life, which is always full of life. And you replaced it with broken cisterns that can't hold fresh water, that hold water that sits and stagnates and gets polluted. You exchanged one for the other. I want us to examine this idea of how this applies to the people of Judah. But I also want to see if there's any application that we can make to today. God was Israel's fountain of living water. He delivered from Egyptian bondage, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 6. He led them through the wilderness wanderings. He brought them into the land that was full of milk and honey. For that God was forgotten. <laughs> Her own priests and rulers, verse 8, had forgotten God. Notice how God puts this. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? It's as if they didn't care where the Lord was. Here's the tribe that was specific, whose specific duty was to be faithful to the Lord and make sure that the people were following the Lord. And if the priests and the leaders and the elders and the rulers of the people were not keeping God in their mind, then they weren't going to provide that spiritual nutrition to the rest of the tribes. Where is the Lord? They didn't even ask. Where is the Lord? They weren't seeking Him. They weren't looking for Him. They did not care. From one generation to the next, God ceased from the memories of the people. Verse 9, God said, I will yet plead with you, and with your children's children will I plead. As if God was saying, I'm going to plead until someone answers. God here then in verse 10 and verse 11 says, other nations are faithful to their gods. The irony here are very thick. <laughs> he says, pass over to the Isles of Chittim and see and send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. They had uh, provided for themselves false gods. But do you know that they were faithful to those false gods? They never changed false gods. They never left those false gods. But God says in verse 11, Hath a Nathan changed their gods which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. The glory which Israel had was that they were obedient to the one true God of heaven. And that was their glory. Their glory didn't come from their own selves. It came from the fact that they were following God. God said, you've exchanged that for that which brings no profit. You've exchanged that for something that cannot bring you up out of Egypt. They can't, these false gods cannot lead you in, out of wander, wandering in the wilderness. These false gods can do nothing for you. So you've exchanged the glory of God for that which profits nothing. Today, Jesus says that He is the source of living waters. You remember in John chapter 4, 
as Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. In verse 7, There cometh a, woman, or cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. And the woman, verse 9, of Samaria said to Him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of Me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said, verse 10, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked Him, and He would have given thee living water. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. We have a fountain of living water. That life-giving water comes from Jesus. That water is His example, His teachings, His law. He promised and it came to this Samaritan woman in John chapter 7, He also promised this living water to all who would believe on Him. John chapter 7, verse 39. Well, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to Me and drink. And he that believeth on Me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. But this spake He of the Spirit, which that they believe on Him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Obviously, when Jesus ascended to heaven, He sent forth the Holy Spirit to guide the disciples, those men who would be His apostles, into all truth. That all truth has been written down for us and preserved to this day. When we read it, we read the Word of God. We read the Word of Christ. We read the Word revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. It truly is life-giving. It's like fresh water that sustains life. Man cannot live without water. And this water is the water that leads to eternal life. Just as those in Israel and Judah had forgotten where that living water come from, people today forget too. A fountain springing up unto everlasting life, John chapter 4, verse 14. Rivers of living water flowing from the heart to lead us to living fountains of water to that place where the water flows. Revelation 22, verse 1 the throne of God. It is possible that we, just like Israel and Judah, face the possibility of departing from the living God. That we forsake God, the living water, in search of something else. When we forsake our fountain of living water, the second evil takes place. It's substituted with something else. In Israel and Judah's circumstance, God said they had hewed out for themselves cisterns. The life-giving water came freely from God. They didn't have to hew out any stones. But Israel and Judah did not like it, so they they hew out of stones cisterns, hoping for water, but providing no good. The first evil was to forsake God. The second evil was to replace God. When individuals forsake God, it's only a matter of time before they replace Him with something. This is a principle that we apply to many things today. We say many times we don't live in a vacuum. When something leaves, something takes its place. When God is, when we take God out of our minds, we fill our minds with something else. When we take God out of our hearts, we fill our hearts with something else. 
it is inevitable. So to forsake God is only the first part of the problem. To leave God, to turn away from God, but then to replace God with something of man's choosing. A broken cistern. One such broken cistern was a false god mentioned here in this particular text in verse 8. That prophets had prophesied of Baal, the false god Baal. They knew that these false gods were no gods at all, or should have known. But because of the idolatrous, lascivious, ungodly worship that, that associated such false worship, they gave in to the temptation. They had a false sense of prosperity because everybody else was doing it. Israel foolishly left God and replaced Him with a poor substitute. A, fall, a broken cistern. A cistern that could hold no water. A cistern that could hold no profit. A cistern that couldn't even give water. And they replaced that life-giving water with this stale, stagnant, worthless cistern hewn by their own hands. Today, people can hew out their own broken cisterns. They leave God and they replace Him. In Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 5, Paul says, For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Here the Apostle Paul says that coveting is the exact equal of idolatry. Those who covet, those who see things and desire things that they themselves do not have in an inordinate way. So much so that they are obsessed with wanting or desiring a certain thing. Whether they can't afford it or they're just jealous that someone else has it. They replace God with the desire to have something that they can't have. This covetousness is their idol. They continually to seek to be like the Joneses or better than the Joneses. Or they hate the Joneses because they have something that I can't have. God says you can replace Him with such idle, foolish thoughts. Materialism and immorality a form of broken cisterns. We can also be guilty of doing what they did to follow after false religions, to follow after false prophets. The Apostle Peter warned of this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, "...there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them out, or that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be spoken of, and through uh, covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Sadly, there are individuals either for their own filthy lucre's sake or for their own arrogance sake. Teach what can fill their own bellies. Teach what can bring them the most gain. Making merchandise of those who listen. Using them for their own gain. These individuals who follow such teachers are led into sectarianism and denominationalism. They follow after a divided religion. 
rather than a united worship that Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. That we would all be one like He and the Father are one. Ephesians 4, verses 3, verse 6, that we would be united just as there is one God and one Son and one Father above all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There are many in the world who offer false hopes. Hopes that can't be realized. Get rich quick schemes. Individuals who offer new age um, thinking as a replacement for true worship. Meditations and yoga and things of that nature in, in form of religion. Self examination separate and apart from the Word of God. We can be guilty and led away into such broken cisterns. We can, like Judah and Israel, have a false sense of prosperity. Just as Judah looked around and saw everybody doing the same thing. Even the priests and the elders, right? And they felt like we're enjoying the benefits of What's taking place? We too can have that false sense of prosperity. Feeling that we are spiritually secure. Israel never ever thought that it would fall to Assyrian captivity and it did. Judah never ever thought that it would be taken captivity, uh, taken into Babylonian captivity. But less than a hundred years after what we just read in Jeremiah 2, they were taken into captivity as well. Rather than learning from the mistakes of the northern tribes, they fell to the same foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We are in gravest danger of falling when we think we are the most secure. Sadly, even in the church of Christ, there are those that though they teach the truth, that it is possible for one to fall away, they do not practice that. They live as if they could never fall away. They live in such a way as to say, once saved, always saved. Now they teach, they teach the truth. They say with words what the Bible says. But with their actions and their deeds and their lives and the living it up, it's as if they've forsaken God and replaced Him with something else. We can be guilty of leaving God and then substituting poor, worthless, broken sister to replace that true worship. So here, we find two evils that have plagued man from the very beginning really. Forsaking or leaving God Choosing not to obey God, in other words. And then replacing Him with something that is a poor substitute. They forsook the light. They forsook the prosperity, the security, the happiness that could only come from following God. And then they hewed out for themselves broken cisterns, joined themselves to idols and the, the ungodly idol worship that accompanied it. They did receive some temporal pleasure but they received no spiritual good. Their conduct was not becoming of a follower of God. It was excess and foolishness. It was the blind leading the blind. How much more would it be in excess of folly and blindness for us today to do the same? Judah was foolish not to follow the example of Israel. We would be foolish not to follow both of their examples. 
to forsake God, the Christ, and His Holy Spirit by neglecting the revealed Word of God, by neglecting our worship and by neglecting devotion to God, by, de- by neglecting our obedience to God, and then, as is always the case, replacing Him, replacing His worship, replacing His uh, the devotion that belongs to Him with our time in other places. To spend time separate from God who could offer the living water that freely flows. To forsake that living water, to neglect that water, to neglect the obedience and the worship of God, and then replace it by drinking from broken cisterns. Broken cisterns hewn by men. That could be the teachings or traditions of men. It could simply be just what an individual wants to do. An individual can have self-worship and do simply what he wants to do. Rather than drinking from the fountain of life, he drinks from the broken cistern of self. Now the unfortunate example of Israel and Judah are written for our admonition. They They serve as a warning. A warning as to where true life-giving water comes that it never runs out. But that we can run away from it. That we can be susceptible to wanting to replace it. May we ever be open to the wonderful invitation provided by the Christ in Revelation 22 and verse 17, the Bible says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Today we ask, we're drinking some sort of water. What water are we drinking? Are we drinking the life-giving water or the stale, stagnant, worthless profitless water of man-made broken cisterns. The importance is to understand the difference and and to distinguish the two because one leads to eternal life and one leads to the exact opposite. To have eternal life, one must hear the Word of God, believe it, repent of his past sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the source of that life, salvation, to be immersed in water to have his past sins washed away than to be faithful to the end. If you've already obeyed those initial steps but have fallen away in some form, if it's of a private sin, please take care of that privately. If you've done something publicly that you'd like assistance with, we're here to pray with you and for you. We're here to help anyone that we can as we stand and sing. Why, King?